Hi and welcome to my OCRA A-Level Biology Revision with me Christine. So today's lesson I'm going to look at slide preparation and staining and that's part of your module 2 cell structure topic. So there are different ways in which we can prepare our slides that we're going to use with our light microscope. And the first way to do this is a dry mount. This is the easy, simple way where we're going to take a solid specimen. We use a sharp blade to slice thin sections of the sample. Now it's important that it's a sharp blade because we need those sections to be thin enough so that they can allow enough of that light to penetrate through the sample. If we want to use a wet mount, normally with aquatic samples, we're going to suspend the sample in some form of a liquid. Now it could be water, it could be a solution, it could be immersion oil. The reason we do this is we want to prevent the dehydration of the cells or we want to prevent the distortion of the tissues. So it's important that we ensure that the liquid is completely covering our sample and to do that what we would do is place our cover slip at an angle on top of the liquid and then slowly lower the cover slip down until it is completely covering the whole specimen. Now what that should do is by doing it at an angle the liquid will actually stick to the cover slip and as you lower it down slowly that should prevent air bubbles from being within your sample. Now it's important as you look down the microscope and you look at the sample that you are able to identify the difference between the cells you're looking for and air bubbles. So it's important that you lower that cover slip at an angle. Another way in which we can prepare a slide is through using what's called the squash slides. Now this is normally for a soft sample and we will use this if we're looking at root tips and we want to identify mitosis. So first we need to do what's known as the wet mount and then once that cover slip is on top of our specimen and we have our solution all the way through, what we then do is we would either gently press on top of the cover slip or we might put another microscope slide on top of that cover slip and gently press on both of them. Now it's important that we gently press because we do not want to damage the cover slip or the tissues we want to observe. Again, the reason we would do a squash slide is that we want to allow the ability for us to see individual cells. We need as much light to penetrate through so we can identify the different parts. So in this case, if we're looking at root tips and we're looking at mitosis, we want to see the chromosomes. So we need our sample to be extremely thin so the light can penetrate through so we can identify those chromosomes. We may want to use what's known as a smear slide. So to prepare a smear slide, that would be if we were looking at blood and blood cells. Now what you would do is you would take your sample of the blood, you would then get that to the edge of a slide. So just like I've shown in my picture above where it, the cover slip is at an angle, in this case you normally use another slide. So you would get the blood to the edge of the slide and then you would smear that blood down leaving a thin even coating. So the edge of the slide is going to be used to smear the sample down through the slide and then once you have done your smearing you would then place a cover slip on top. Now it's important that we want to again see the cells and allow the light to penetrate. So what they tend to do in the exam is they tend to ask you either to improve a technique where a student has written down what they've done. If they're asking you to improve that technique, the key thing to think about is has the student done enough to let the light penetrate the sample? That's one of the marking points that tends to come up a lot in the exam. Now the next thing we would want to do potentially is stain our sample. Now by staining the sample that will increase the contrast so we can see different components within the cell because they will take up the stain at different degrees. Now you should know 
at least two stains as a go-to if you're ever asked to use or give an example of a stain. So the first one, which is quite an easy one to remember, is the methylene blue. That one comes up quite a lot. But you can either use crystal violet or methylene blue. Now these are positively charged dyes. So it's important that you note that if it's a positively charged dye, it is going to be attracted to a negatively charged material. So with the methylene blue and the crystal violet, because they're positively charged, we use them because they will bind to thick cell walls which will allow us to identify specific types of cells. And they are also able to be used because they will bind to negatively charged material, i.e. your DNA, inside the nucleus. So it's a way in which we can identify the nucleus within a cell. For example, in my diagram, you can see here quite clearly that there is the cell wall and you can also see the nucleus. So this is where I've used methylene blue and it has stained the cell and it is now observable in my light microscope. Another one that you could use is the Congo Red. So this is a negatively charged dye. Now, because it's negatively charged, negative and negative repel each other. So therefore, this would actually be repelled from the cytosol and it would stay on the outside of the cell. So it's a way in which you could identify the inside of a cell compared to the outside of a cell. It can also be used because it binds to the likes of proteins and carbohydrates. So if they're going to give you information in the exam, they are expecting you to be able to pull out the notes of how they link together. So in the exam, they probably would have told you that it's negatively charged and you would then be expected to note that it would be repelled from a substance which is negatively charged or attracted to a substance which is positively charged. So they would expect you to have that knowledge already. But it's important you do have at least two that you have in the bank of your knowledge to pull forward if they say, name a stain that can be used. So I would always go for methylene blue and Congo red as my two examples. They're the oppositely charged dyes, so I just have to remember which one is which. I know methylene blue is really good at staining the DNA, so I know that has to be positively charged. That therefore makes my Congo red the negatively charged dye. There are a few other ones that they will give you, for example, Sudan um, 1, you've got the Carbophilsins and you've got the Nile Blue. Now, if they're going to give you any of these examples, they will tell you a little bit about the information. So it's a lipid soluble dye, for example, allows you to visualise fat deposits. If it's a non-polar dye, they're expecting you to understand that it's non-polar, it doesn't have a polarity, so therefore if I've got a lipid solvent, that lipid solvent will allow that dye to be carried to where it needs to go and that tends to be used in microbiology if we're trying to look at what's known as acid fast bacteria. And Nile Blue, we're looking at the lipid soluble dye. Again, it's lipid soluble, so we know it's going to stain lipids and triglycerides. But in the exam, if they want you to know anything about these dyes, they will specifically give you the information, for example, that's lipid soluble or it's a non-polar, and they'll be expecting you to then apply that to a situation. So make sure you do know at least two and that they are used as a way of increasing the contrast. So how do we actually stain a sample then? Well, the first thing we need to do is we're gonna use forceps to place this thin sample on our glass side, whatever that may be. We always allow it to air dry and that will then be passed through a flame and that is going to fix that sample in position using heat. So the reason we're passing it through the flame is because we want to do what's known as heat fixing the sample. So that's gonna make our sample adhere to the slide and also make it more accepting of the dye, the stain that we want to use. 
So we're then going to pipette our stain at the edge of the sample. We're going to lower that cover slip at an angle using a mounted needle. And then we would tend to use blotting paper. They, that may be blue towel in your school if that's what you're using. And what that blue towel, that blotting paper will do is that will remove any excess stain. So you literally want the stain to cover and bind to the parts that it should bind to and then any excess which which would obscure the light being able to penetrate through you want to remove that because basically what you're doing by using these stains is you're affecting how the light is able to be transmitted through so if there is something that is in position i.e the methyl and blue that is going to appear darker because that will absorb the light and block it from coming through. So we can use this blotting paper to remove the excess stain. Also, what the blotting paper can do, it actually would pull the stain through using capillary action. So if you have got too much stain, you want to remove it, you're gonna use that capillary action to remove that excess of the stain. Now, it's important that we note that we're Normally, if we're looking at a sample and we want to distinguish between types of cells or we want to distinguish between different components within the cells, we would tend to use more than one stain, which is why I say make sure you've got one which is the positively charged dye and one which is the negatively charged dye. Now that contrast allows us to be able to distinguish between, for example, is it a gram positive bacteria or a gram negative bacteria? Also, it can help us to visualize different components like, for example, DNA compared to cytoplasmic proteins. So it's important that you note that there are different stains and also why we need to use more than one stain. So here is an example where we have what's known as differential staining, where we can distinguish between two types of either organisms, gram positive, gram negative, or between different organelles within a tissue sample. So we want to distinguish, in this case, between the cells. So here we have a blood smear and that blood smear, we can quite clearly see that there are different cells. We have erythrocytes and we also have different types of lymphocytes. And I'll talk about those in my module four session video on the immune response. But what we're really interested in, and this is what they'll do in the exam, is they'll give you one that you've never heard of before. So here's a new stain, which is hematoxylin. Now hematoxylin, you're told, is going to stain nucleic acids blue. You're now told that eosin, which is an acidic dye, is going to stain cytoplasmic and extracellular proteins pink or red. So if you were given that sort of information, what they're expecting you to do is then apply that to the picture that's in front of you. So we can quite clearly see that cell D has a lot of cytoplasmic proteins because we can see that red colour in comparison to the other cells. We can see that there is a differential staining because the hematoxylin has identified where the nucleus is within the cells. So this is one of the ways in which we would be using stains to identify different parts, different components within a cell. Now, it's an interesting picture they've given us here because they've also given us a bit more information. So I'm going to, going to apply some knowledge here. If you haven't already checked out my microscopes lesson, then please do. And I've also got one on the cell use with graticules. So if I want to identify the size of a sample, then I would always be using a scale bar. So in this example, they have given me a scale bar and they've told me that my magnification is times 1250. So I would first of all use a ruler and measure that scale bar and that tells me that my image size is 1.5 centimeters. 
I know that I always want to convert that into micrometers, so therefore I need to times that by 10,000. That gives me 15,000 micrometers. Now I need to use my I am triangle, so I've got my image size, they've given me my magnification, so I need to divide those two together, and that will allow me to work out what my actual size is, and my actual size is 12 micrometers. So remember that all of this information that you're learning will be asked together in one exam question, as they did with this picture. Now, the other thing they could do is they could actually give you a question which looks like this. So this is where we have a lot of information. They've told us a few stains, a few bits of procedure, which we haven't yet covered. Differential staining is used to identify gram-positive bacteria between gram-negative bacteria. But what's important is when you've got questions like this, that you look at the information they've given you. They've told us that the gram-positive bacteria have thick cell walls and they've told us the gram-negative bacteria have thin cell walls. So therefore, they are giving us hints in the question. Then what we need to do is we need to say, okay, what else have they told us? Always take the time to read the stem of the question. So they've also told us crystal violet stains it purple. Saffronin is not visible in the presence of crystal violet. They've told us that the alcohol is going to remove any fixed stains and they've told us it only removes it from the thin cell walls. And they've told us that this iodine fixes the crystal violet. So what they would then expect you to do is put that all together to come up with the order. So crystal violet would be the first stain I would want to use because that's going to stain all my bacteria purple. Then what I need to do is I need to ensure that I fix that crystal violet to the bacterial cells. I want to fix it in place, so I'm going to use the iodide solution to fix it. But then I want to distinguish between thick cell walls and thin cell wall bacteria, therefore I'm now going to use the alcohol to remove the fixed stain from only my thin cell walls, and then I'm going to stain them with a different stain which is the one that turns them pink so now I can distinguish between the two different kinds. So do make sure that when you are reading the exam questions whether it's a mock or whether it is an end of topic test or whether it's your real exam that you are using the information that they've given you. One of the best techniques that you can do is take your time to read the question to highlight the key bits information and to pull that apart. So I hope you liked this video. If you did, please do click on the like button and subscribe to my channel. Also, check out my revision platform, www.eiqchat.com to help you to revise.